I think uh, many of you may have uh, already seen it. It's a film in 2011, United States, directed by the independent filmmaker Lee Fulkerson and produced by Brian Wendell. This film advocates a low that, uh, for a low-fat diet, diet, whole food plant-based diet, as a means of battling a number of diseases. We also have the great privilege, may I say, of having here today with us Dr. Colin Campo, who is a leading biochemist who specializes in the effect of nutrition on long-term health. As our keynote speaker today. He, uh, he's featured actually in the film, Forks Over Knives, and he's one of the main scientists behind the issues advocated in the film. Dr. Campo is the Jacob Gold Sherman Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry at Cornell University. He is the author of over 300 research papers on whole foods and plant-based diets, and two books, among them Poe, published last, this year actually, and also the China Study, which I already saw a copy here, somebody brought it for it to be signed by Dr. Campo. Uh, you have uh, some of your friends here in the audience today. Uh, in the year 2005, it was um, one of uh, the best sellers of that year, the, the, and one of the best selling books about nutrition. Dr. Campbell was also one of the lead scientists in the 1980s China Oxford Cornell study on diet and disease, set up in 1983 by Cornell University, the University of Oxford, and the Chinese Akaya. Academy of Preventive Medicine to explore the relationship between nutrition and cancer, heart and metabolic disease. The study was described by the New York Times as the Grand Prix of epidemiology. We'd like to give Dr. Campbell a very warm welcome to Paul. We're delighted to have you here. Dr. Campbell, after your presentation, we'll have the screening of the film, and I hope that we'll have a very, very lively debate after. Unfortunately, I will need to leave in about an hour, so I will leave in the very good hands of Barbara Berlin-Ning, who is the Deputy Director of the Nutrition Commission. Thank you so much for that, those very kind remarks. I especially like to comment that uh, this uh, series sponsors civil debate. It's very nice um, because this particular topic is pretty provocative, to say the least. Uh, it was provocative for me as well as for many others who worked in my field. And so uh, you'll see the film for those of you have, who have not seen the film. How many of you have seen the film? Anybody see the film? Oh, fantastic. Great. <laughs> I hope it still remains a civil debate after it's over. I think it will. Um, I want to uh, give you a little background on the film, or, or a background on, on my own research, which actually, I'm told, led to the film. The producers in California, actually in Hollywood, uh, got quite impressed with this information, came to listen to one of my lectures and then decided to do a film. And in the process of doing the film and following me around for quite a long time, they also included the work of other researchers as well to kind of flesh out uh, this particular discussion. So uh, before giving you just a brief, brief synopsis of some of the work that I've been doing, actually for, I started my research career 57 years ago, probably before many of you were born, I guess. Been around the barn, as one can say, uh, and I, I started up in a place that's rather different than what I where I'm now. So I want to just give you a little background on first myself very briefly, and then of course some of the discussion regarding our research. That's me on the front of the combine. I was raised on a dairy farm. Um, I was in fact the first to even leave the farm for my family to go to school to go to college. So I, I came from a situation where food was largely a matter of consuming the food we generally eat on farms, especially livestock-based farms. And then following that, I did my doctoral degree at Cornell University, 
the technical topic you can see there, but it really has to do with promoting uh, more consumption of protein, especially animal-based protein. Uh, there was a general feeling for probably 150 years that protein is terribly important. We know it's important. It's an essential nutrient. But uh, at the same time, we tend to think, too, that we want high-quality protein, high-quality protein, basically meaning, for technical reasons, animal-based protein. So um, that's my personal and my professional background, advocating, advocating for the consumption of diets richer and richer in animal-based protein. Then in one of my early positions at Virginia Tech University, I was coordinator of the program, a nationwide program of feeding malnourished children in the Philippines. Did that for about 10 years from my first university position at Virginia Tech. And there in the Philippines, as I'm sure you are all well aware, uh, there are countries in the world where malnutrition of children is pretty serious. And uh, we worked there setting up uh, centers around the country. And again, it was from our perspective and the perspective of many of my colleagues in nutrition, uh, essentially, that children were malnourished primarily because they weren't getting enough protein, especially high quality protein, in addition to not getting enough calories as well. So those are the two sort of main sort of theses that we tended to follow in those days, making sure they get enough good quality protein as well as enough uh, calories to go with it. And as I say, we set up these little centers around the country educating mothers that their children actually could gain health merely from the presence of good food, not necessarily waiting for the doctor to show up. So now, the findings, um, unfortunately, I had this didn't project here on this projector. On the left, there was supposed to be the book that was published, apart from my new friend here. This is the China study that we're referring to. And this is the book that was published in 2005, um, published with my youngest son, who at the time was a stage guy, he was on theater, in theater. He later got so enthralled with this, he went back to medical school, he's now a physician, and uh, working with him in his category. But in any case, this book has uh, turned out to be uh, much more successful than what I have been led to believe. It's merely a report, in a sense, of what I had been doing in the previous 40 years or so in my laboratory with my many colleagues. Uh, and so it was, it was, in a sense, as a research that had to do with the relationship of diet with health. Coming, of course, from uh, my experience in the, my graduate program as well as my experience in the Philippines with the children. And it was particularly focused in the beginning on cancer. I had an interest in cancer, especially what we refer to as carcinogenesis or chemical carcinogenesis, if you will. Cancer being caused by chemicals, that was sort of my special area of interest. Uh, in any case, going through the years and teaching this subject and doing research on this subject and publishing a lot and working with my colleagues over the years, uh, we did research in a way that we all did. We tend to look at one nutrient at a time to see what it does, its chemical properties, its physical properties, and so forth. I finally came to the conclusion after some time that was not the best way to do research. Uh, and then subsequently wrote the second book called Whole, it was published recently. I'll try to get into that and maybe we can talk about that at the end. But this is a very different view of nutrition as I was taught this subject and as I in turn taught my students. So starting this journey, uh, I think, uh, began with in the Philippines. When we went there to make sure these children got enough protein, most people in the Philippines, that poor country where we were working at least, uh, they were not getting enough protein. Uh, you all know the story of being here in this agency, I'm sure, that protein is very, very important. We've got to make sure we get enough. It turned out that the, one day, I just didn't know one day, but I, I came to the impression, because of interest in this, that the few families who were consuming the most protein, and there was just three or four percentage of the families perhaps, but in any case, the few families consuming the most protein seem to have children that got a, a particular kind of cancer, liver cancer to be, particular, to be specific in a very young age. And so that was kind of odd. And then I, I didn't quite believe it when I heard it. It was anecdotal. It was not published. Uh, but then this report came out uh, 
from India uh, and, and study an experimental animal. Where these investigators were interested in that same kind of cancer, primary liver cancer, and they wanted to know something about its relationship with protein. Their hypothesis was higher levels of protein would help to prevent the cancer. I mean, that's what we all tended to think protein was good, more and better. They did this study here, and you can see that 20% protein, which is the recommended levels, the higher levels, fed to animals that are actually programmed with a carcinogen to get the liver cancer. But when they fed the 20% dietary protein, you see 100% got the cancer. In contrast, the animals fed the lower levels of protein, generally considered to be inadequate but for other reasons, no cancer, even though those animals had been exposed to a very potent carcinogen. So this is striking. I saw this obscure journal, but it sort of gave me some confidence that maybe what I was thinking of seeing them in children, one and the same thing, higher protein, higher cancer. Which was, as you can, I'm sure, agree, very provocative. We're going to the Philippines to advocate for the consumption of more protein, but we had to think about this problem. You know, were we going to constantly cause some difficulties? That was, this work here, incidentally, published in 1968, just to give you some reference point. I was doing my work in the Philippines from about 1965 until 1975. So I came home with this observation, and I decided uh, that it was worthy of some further research. And so we got funding from the National Institutes of Health that was to continue for that project for the next 27 years. During those 27 years, I was really interested in the subject first of what will this protein have to do with cancer, and I wanted to understand, understand cancer better. But uh, as the years went by, my interest became much broader, much pro more profound than just the question of protein on just experimental cancer itself. So it, it, the, the, the story just actually grew like this in a very broad perspective involving total human health. So we did some studies. I'm going to show you just a couple of uh, observations here that really triggered our thinking. This is a plot of cancer that grows in experimental animals that's actually given a carcinogen. The carcinogen in this particular case being aflatoxin. I think some of you here in this agency may know what aflatoxin is. In any case, aflatoxin is a potent chemical carcinogen. It's a mold metabolite. It causes primary liver cancer in experimental animals, okay? That was a big issue during the 1960s and 1970s, incidentally. Uh, these animals are exposed to aflatoxin, which causes a mutation to cause the cancer. Animals given the 20% protein, as you can see, the dotted red line up at the top, the animals given the 5% at the bottom. Big difference, just like what the Indian workers have reported. So now I want to show you in this particular presentation, this representation here. What happens when we change the dietary intake back and forth? You can see that in the first three weeks, this is early cancer. In the first three weeks, the 20% protein diet essentially is or sort of uh, promoting to develop the cancer. You switch it to 5% and turn it off. You have 20% to turn it back on again. 5% turn it off. In those days, and this was uh, very early on, you know, these data I'm showing here is 1990, in the 1990s, but actually we had done it quite a bit earlier than that, but this is just a more formal presentation of the data. In any case, um, what this was demonstrating to me was something very novel and new and different, really quite different. It was suggesting that our level of nutrient intake, at least in these rats, was able to control the development of cancer, which in those days was quite a quite an exciting uh, idea. So it ends up with what I would call a principle. A principle being an observation that's sort of a fundamental observation that will hold for the duration of time and different species and under different conditions and so forth. It turned out then, skipping over a whole lot of research, I now want to just mention to you the protein that we're using because this is where it became particularly provocative. Namely, the protein we were using to turn on the cancer, as I like to say, was casein, the main protein of cow's milk. And this is why I told you I came from a dairy farm. And why I did my doctorate dissertation on the idea that the more protein of that kind we consume, the better we're going to be. It was my views. To see something like this was striking. 
It took me at least almost two years, even so it was so dramatic, to really digest it from a technique. But you know, to digest this information and set it. So we then, uh, in turn, tried a couple of plant proteins, even when fed at the 20% level of total energy. Soy protein, wheat protein. It did not do it. So here we had an illustration early on that this animal based protein could turn on cancer. Two plant proteins did not. Quite striking, I think you would agree. Even though this was experimental animals, even though this was only one kind of cancer, you know, all the limitations we have in research, obviously. But it was striking. So then the question was, how broad is this effect? Does it involve other situations, other nutrients, and other cancers and other diseases, and so forth? That's why my research really began to branch. We learned a lot about this particular relationship here, understanding something about mechanisms, which I'll show you in a moment. In any case, there's a principle, if you like, and this was suggested as a principle in those days. Now it's confirmed, in my view, substantially. The nutrients of animal-based foods function differently from nutrients of plant-based foods. As far as cancer is concerned, the view was in those days that chemical carcinogens were the chief cause of cancer as far as food was concerned, like apricotoxin and a few other things. And so we worry about that. We make regulations about this. We analyze foods according to this. So chemical carcinogens have often been considered for many, many years to be a main cause of cancer. Of course, over the years, we've also discovered two certain viruses. Hepatitis B virus, um, papillomavirus, Epstein-Barr virus. So there's been a few cancers that we've learned over the years that also obviously play a significant role in developing cancers and genes. A lot of people talk about Cancer is really a product of genes. In a more general context, we get cancer according to our family backgrounds, if you will, genetic background. Everything starts with genes, I should tell you, <coughs> including cancer. There's a set of genes, all physiological, I mean, physiological and pathological events begin from a genetic basis. So that's a given. But it's not necessarily the cause. If you have the genes present, that does not necessarily mean that we're going to get the disease. This new idea of nutrition, when nutrients are consumed at the incorrect levels, and nutrition just simply being a cause of cancer is really an exciting proposition. Because here now, we're talking about everyone. We're talking about all kinds of doctor situations. It's a question of going to define for ourselves what we mean by nutrition. What kind of characteristics do we have to think about? As I say, chemical carcinogens were considered the main causes of cancer in food. And I want to just, uh, I, I kind of stick this, up, stuck this in, in for a side because I'm speaking, I know FAO, and I know some of you have had this interest. I know some WHO has had this interest. I've spoken to groups at WHO, and I want to bring to your attention because I think some, how many of you know about aflatoxin? I'm curious. Well, of us, of hands, I never get those kind of hands on the middle points. Um, I'm saying that aflatoxin's story is a story that has, been, has taken a long turn. I was deeply involved in this field for about 20 years. But it took a turn that I do not approve of, I must tell you. WH has it wrong. Basically, evidence does not support aflatoxin as a human person. And I can expound on that in case some of you want to know, but Perhaps some of you might want to know too the basis for the research that uh, where we demonstrated that we did the most comprehensive study of the factors causing human cancer or human liver cancer uh, ever done. In fact, our study is more comprehensive than all the others put together. It was a study primarily in China, and, and I'm really confident of this. Aflatoxin is not a significant human carcinogen. The implications of which I think many of you may know where that might lead if you stop and think about it. That's just a, it's kind of a sidebar story. Um, strictly speaking, in fact, casein is more carcinogenic than aflatoxin. Again, easily demonstrated. I'm not, saying, I'm not giving off on this to you as a joke. This is, this, is, this is really true. If I compare the amount of casein, or let's say other casein, like complex like animal protein, with chemical carcinogens, like aflatoxin, right? If I compare the two, there's no comparison. The nutrient, uh, 
ability to act in a carcinogenic way is far, far more significant than aflatoxin ever would be. So now, I want to raise another question, because it's become significant, at least in the evolution of my own ideas that they began to expand. How does casein work? You, you know, when we know, you know this is research, if we see A causes B, and it's unusual and it's provocative, and we don't want to believe it maybe, the thing that we want then to turn our attention to, biologically at least, what is the mechanism that causes it to create that response? So it's a good question. I think we all we all just do that. So I want to show you in respect to, in this case, cancer, how we sort of look at that question concerning the mechanism responsible for the casein effect. And here I'm showing you just sort of a schematic timeline for cancer development, which is generally comprised of, as we say in research, purely arbitrary, more or less, it's generally comprised of about three stages. We initiate cancer, generally mean a genetic, a genetic event, you know, caused by maybe a chemical carcinogen. Maybe, in any case, a new genetic event that obviously perturbs the gene, so we got a genetic event there. Then there's a second stage we call it promotion. That's when the cancer starts evolving over time, starting with one cell, two cells, geometric growth. Eventually, we get a mass of cells that we can call basically neoplastic. So that takes quite a bit of time. And quite frankly, when I started, first started this work in the late 60s and early 70s, I was aware of another observation from the smoking world that suggested that the second stage promotion actually could be reversible. In other words, when you start take heavy smokers, they quit their smoking, it takes about 10 years for the risk high here to come back to baseline. Which suggests, in fact, that you know, maybe this disease is reversible, if you will, at least before it becomes fully man manifest. So it's, uh, I, I, with, this, with that observation in mind, with that observation in mind, I said, well, now we saw what we saw in the cancer, liver cancer thing in the rats. This adds to the idea that maybe nutrition could work in a very important second stage. Uh, possibly, if you could adjust nutrient intake, you could control the disease, not just for cancer, but for other diseases. Well, progression is at the latter stage, and uh, I would argue that we have now considerable evidence that for a number of diseases that what are the factors that cause promotion of, for a disease to progress forward are much the same kind of factors that continue to work even toward almost the end stage of the disease. So whether it can be reversed or it kind of means is a Hypothesis, I think, of a lot of support for that in many cases. So we look for the mechanism to explain how casein works. First stage, first stage. Uh, we, I started looking at one, you know, an obvious mechanism. Maybe it was an effect on the enzyme, the synthesis of an enzyme that activates chemical carcinogens like aflatoxin, the mixed function oxidase system. In case any of you know this, so I wanted to know: Does protein affect the synthesis of that enzyme activity? Does it affect the binding of the carcinogen metabolite, which is highly active and electrophilic? Does it bind, does it affect the ability of that carcinogen to bind to DNA and cause mutation? Kind of a second mechanism, if you will. What about cell transport? What about altering the structure of the enzyme itself? We spent, I guess, maybe 10, 15 years really probing that particular area of work. And protein, as it's just, just in the diet, has dramatic effects on all those things. I could not, I could not decide for one that w which one was the mechanism, more or less, like the rate limiting mechanism. It didn't seem reasonable to make that supposition. So then we looked at um, activities or mechanisms, if you will, during the second stage. Once again, we, every time we look for the mechanism, we found one. Very troubling. I mean, it was almost frustrating. Why are we doing this research? It was a lot of fun. We got money to do it, think about it. But I couldn't put my finger on what exactly what the wish mechanism was the key mechanism. Finally, it dawned on me, and I've stuck with it ever since. Nutrients act, when they act, they grow in the body like other chemicals. They cause almost a plethora or tsunami of mechanisms that tend to converge in almost like a symphony to create a response. So it's not one mechanism that I, I have to tell you, you have to ask you to consider this possibility. That has major implications 
for the way we think about nutrition, or I should say incorrect way we actually think about nutrition. I'll return to that a little bit later. And that was an exciting thing that involved a huge amount of research and I burned up a lot of graduate students that way because every one of those mechanisms generally involved a graduate student working for any worse than four to five or six even more years to work those details out. So it leads for me to a principle, once again. It applies not just to protein, but it applies to all kinds of nutrients as well. Nutrients act not by one, but by countless mechanisms as if they were acting in symphony. The practical implication of this idea, incidentally, would question our use of nutrient supplements as a means of nutrition. And we now know, for the most part, they do not work. Uh, it, it also questions, in fact, the whole fundamental basis for, for a drug, for approaching illness through the use of drugs. Because there again, we're looking for a chemical, in this case, a foreign chemical, I might add, to see if we can block some particular event and lead the veteran to the disease. So this, is, this has major implications, the idea that nutrients act in this sort of manner. So now let me turn your attention to um, what dietary levels of casein are important. Everybody wants to know that, of course. We got some hint of that in our experimental animal studies. We fed different levels of protein, not just the 5%, 20%, but we fed 4, 6, 8, and 10, as you can see, and then on upwards to 20%. We saw this interesting curve where a threshold was indicated. In other words, protein is a good thing to know that. It's serving good purposes. It's a good nutrient. We need it. It's absolutely essential. Up to a point, everything's fine. It's only when we exceed the level of protein consumption where we begin to run some difficulties at least in that experimental model. That was, in fact, the basis for making that suggestion and became more important to me because goodness of human consumption is in the territory where you might anticipate, if you want to extend your thinking on this a little bit, where you might anticipate that maybe higher levels of protein might actually turn on cancer for humans. And incidentally, protein requirements for rats is about the same as the protein requirement for humans. So it kind of puts it in the same ballpark here. So I think it's kind of reasonable when we saw this here, at least to think about what else can we say about that. Well, I've given a lot of thought on that. I don't have time to go through all the detail there, but I want to just, um, okay, we got a principle here. I just want to uh, now present something to you that has dawned on me in more recent years. This hockey stick effect, threshold kind of thing, in the case of all nutrients, there is a range of normality for good health. For every nutrient, there's a range of normality, normal levels, if you will. If we have too little, we've got a deficiency. If we have too much, we often have problems. So that's the way all nutrients work, is that that's just, this is half of that sort of uh, that equation, if you will. In this case, I'm suggesting here, where you think it's not just about liver cancer or protein, I mean, on liver cancer and rats, I'm suggesting that this is about the relationship between dietary protein and general health of humans. Whether we're talking about increasing cholesterol levels, formation of diabetes, heart disease, even other kinds of conditions that the diseases tend to show this kind of hockey stick effect. So let's explore that a little bit. The, you know, I'm sorry this, this uh, didn't come through right in the projector, but uh, that's RDA. You should be reading out RDA. One question that I wanted to ask was that kind of hockey stick effect. Where is the RDA? Where is the recommended dietary amounts for protein? Well, since 1943, actually, scientists have established that the dietary recommendation for protein is around 8, 9, 10 percent, something in that neighborhood. That's been revisited 14 times every five years since then by the National Academy of Sciences, at least in the United States. And WHO has gone along with it. Other countries have gone along with it, too. It's a good thing. Recommend dietary allowance for protein, 8 tenths of a gram per kilogram, for those who are familiar with those numbers, is, is about, as I say, 9-10% protein. The recommended dietary allowance, people tend to think is the minimum protein we should be consuming. That's an error. That's mythology. That's not true, unfortunately. Because the minimal level of protein that satisfies our requirements for nitrogen is in the neighborhood of 5-6% protein. That's what the experiment shows. When that research was done, and this was an experimental setting, a sample of a small number of people, 
what they did to be assured that the total population got enough, they had two standard deviations for that number. So the minimum, the RDA is the minimum level intake plus two standard deviations. And according to statistical presumptions and theory, if you will, that suggests that 98% of the total population really ought to be getting enough protein when they're considering the RDA, at least in theory. So now we, okay, we say, oh, well, this level of protein, this is ideal. We don't need more than that. So that raises a new question. If this is the ideal level of protein, what are we doing then when we're consuming an average of about 17 or 18 percent protein, at least in Western countries? We tend to strive for these ever more, ever higher levels of protein. We do that. We've been doing it since 1839, almost not when we had the numbers, but when said protein was discovered. And when it was named protein after Greek words, proteos, which means of prime importance. There's a rich history on this protein thing that really is fascinating. But in any case, here we go. The average level of protein by us humans, most of countries, is around 17, 18 percent protein. Now let's, let's take another step here and see what else we can see with this. It turns out that plant-based foods, you know, one, but I should have told you before I showed this here, and I think many of you know this, of course. You know, I'm not saying something you don't know, but in any case, for a long time, people tended to think protein was synonymous with meat. One and the same. Not true. <coughs> Simply not true. Plants have protein too. We have good levels of protein. And so it turns out that if we consume only plants, vegetables, fruits, grains, legumes, and mix and match as you like, the average level of protein more or less is going to be in the neighborhood of around 8, 9, 10 percent. Just at the level we already decided was enough and was ideal. I mean, you can get higher in some plants if you consume a lot of protein extracts and concentrates and stuff like that, but I'm not I'm talking about whole foods is in that neighborhood there. In contrast, animal-based foods are up at the top. And I'm going to show you as we add, you know, you know, I'm talking about a theoretical model, yes, but I'm also talking about a model that we have implicitly experimented on with ourselves for decades. As soon as we start adding a little bit animal-based food, we get the protein up because we want more protein. That's the idea. And that's where we get protein from. You get protein, the extra protein from animal-based foods, you stick a little bit in. Here's what happens. Yes, you may increase the total amount of protein, but in the process, you're actually decreasing to some extent the amount of plant protein being consumed. Because this becomes really a calorie gain. And the calorie, the amount of calorie you consume, it's more or less a zero-sum game with limits. So as you increase the animal protein, you're increasing calories from that kind of food. Therefore, you decrease the consumption of calories from plants before you're decreasing, in fact, the amount of plant protein. OK, now we're going to make, still put more protein in for this model. We're going to stick a lot of protein into our diet. Here's an animal foods. And in that case, we're really beginning to subtract now plant foods pretty substantially. This becomes ever more interesting when we do this. And so there we go for a lot of Western people. We're consuming a lot of protein up in the neighborhood, as I said, 17, 80%, and people are even half the people are even more than that. <laughs> so we're consuming in large measure our carnivorous diet by consuming so much protein. In the process, look what happens to the plant foods. So when we're consuming higher protein to get the great value of protein on the one hand, we're depriving ourselves of something from plants, if there's anything worthy of plants to consider. Let's look at that a little bit. Okay, so we said that a principle. Here's a general comparison of the nutrient content of plant-based foods and animal-based foods. I've, I've divided accordingly here. I didn't include the minerals, as you can see. That's, uh, I can do the same thing. There was a little bit trickier with minerals because of the interaction they have with many things. But in any case, antioxidants, well, if, there is a, if, if there's a primary group of nutrients to consume, I'm going to argue that it is antioxidants. Because our aging process, the cancer process, the heart disease process, is a matter of excessive oxidation, something we generally know these days. So consuming antioxidants really helps to prevent that. Antioxidants are only made in plants. Vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, a lot of vitamin, so called phytochemicals, and so forth and so on. Complex carbohydrates, important substances. 
dietary fibers in that class. All kinds of fibers, com combinations. Only made in plants. Vitamins, I'm going to say only made in plants doing it. Some of them, I'm sure, in here would argue with that, saying, no, you're not quite right. I know vitamin A's and, and animal based foods, and vitamin D is there too. I'm looking at it from a more theoretical point of view. Vitamin D is not a vitamin. I think many of you probably know that. Generally considered a hormone. We can make as much vitamin D for the most part, not always, you know, the vitamin D we really need. Vitamin A was discovered as the retinoid acid, retinal, retinol sort of cluster of groups, the retinoids, if you will. That was considered to be vitamin A. It still is. And then the substance that gives rise to this formation of these retinoids is something like beta carotene. That was called a provitamin. I think it got the nomenclature backwards. The real vitamin is beta carotene and others that can give rise to the retinoids. And the body decides on how much to convert to the retinoids we might need. I mean, you see, you see, see the same thing with other groups across the board, too. So I'm going to argue that the vitamins, those substances that we make, that we have to consume because we have to make them, are actually produced in adequate amounts in plant based material. Now, fat and protein. Both animal-based foods and, and plant-based foods have those, of course. Animal-based foods, on average, have quite a bit higher of uh, both. They're both mischief. They're both mischievous, especially when we start getting up those high levels and running into the difficulties of subtracting, as I just showed a moment ago. There's another class of foods, too. I, I, I would call it a class, sort of a marketing class. It's called a processed foods, or if you will. We mix, mix and match things, even if we take out the stuff like we find sugar out of plants, or maybe the white flour out of plants, and maybe put some of that good oil out of plants, mix it all together, we may have a donut or a danish. Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not the kind of food I'm talking about. So we've got two classes of food here, animal-based foods and processed foods. I would argue the evidence is substantial. It's really overwhelming. They're not health foods, period. They cause problems. There's one class of foods that causes a lot of health. This whole plant is food. So well, I think we can sort of, I prefer to talk about it that way. When you think of it that way, then the question becomes, well, what does this mean? I mean, how can we see anything of any value? I'm going to suggest before I say something else, I need to take a sort of side trip here a little bit. I'm not talking about vegetarian diets, and I'm not talking about bigger diets. That's another whole story in itself. Vegetarians, about 90% of vegetarians are still using dairy, oftentimes fish and eggs. The nutrient composition of those diets are not that different from non-vegetarians. So if you look at, compare their health records, it's, it's just something a little bit of effect there, but not a big deal. Because it's the nutrient composition of foods that determine health. I'm also not talking about vegan diets either. Vegan diets are those diets where everybody shuns all kinds of animal foods. We just don't want anything to do with it. Fine enough, there's a one more as an ideological, ethical issue, uh, ethical kind of decision. They choose for those reasons to eat foods not animal based. But what they end up doing, unfortunately, we have pretty good evidence of this now. They are in, in their effort to do that, so not thinking much about the scientific evidence. They're consuming processed foods, pretty high in fat, and fine carbohydrates, and things like that. So the health otherwise theoretically gained by vegans, much of it is lost. By the way, they actually practice the dietary patterns. So I, I say that a couple of reasons just to point that out. But the other thing is, I did not arrive at this point with any preference or prejudice in favor of those kind of foods for ideological reasons. I simply didn't. It was, for me, a very different sort of game plan of just following the others where it took us and so happens. And that's why I, I was, I've been given the credit for coming up with that very awkward term, whole food plant-based diets, for which we could have a shorter name for it, but that's where it is. And that's where I have the rest of my case, in a sense. It turns out, if you go back in the literature, as we did, especially, I knew some of this through the years, but we did it in a more systematic way when we wrote the book in 2005, asking ourselves, is there any evidence in the literature to show said, some beneficial effects of this so-called whole food, plant-based diet, low in fat, total fat, 10%, low in protein, 10%, the stuff that's typically found in plants. Is there any evidence? All those diseases there, there's period of evidence that those diseases can be prevented, number one. 
for the whole 45 minutes. Right? Much measure? Their progress as occurs with autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis or as occurs with diabetes or heart disease and so forth, their progress at a minimum can be stopped. You switch to a whole food pepper, they can stop it. Many of them, surprisingly, you might be interested to in, know, can be reversed and cured. Cured in the sense that you just eliminate them. And the film you're going to see, in fact, is a documentation of some evidence of that from my colleague and good friend, Dr. Clayton Hunt a surgeon by the name of Dr. Uh, Caldwell Hesselton. Really the dramatic results that we can see in this particular case with all this, these kind of diseases is a big story. So I would call it a principle. Whole food plant based diet, nutritional effect is broad in scope. Lots of you know, adverse health conditions can be uh, recovered with this approach. And it also can be done very rapidly. Angina is gone. Those people have angina is gone in a week or so, two weeks. Diabetes, that requires a good dose of insulin for many people for prolonged periods of time. If people are put on this kind of diet, the dietary effect is so small that if you don't take away the insulin, people can go into hypo hypoglycemic shock. That's how strong the dietary effect is. So, and you see that again in a week, maybe a few days or so. My son, one of my sons, actually has done some of this with just groups of people and seen dramatic results just in 10 days. Just in 10 days. So yeah, I, I couldn't get away with not mentioning briefly the China study itself. We did a study in China. It was Cornell University. We were the lead, lead institution, also from the University of Oxford. Sir Richard Pito, a name you may know well. Sir Richard Dahl, late Richard Dahl, uh, and two of China academies. We have mounted this study early on in the early 1980s. And they came from this plot here, the, the, this atlas that the Chinese had published, showing that cancer, in this case breast cancer, was concentrated geographically, as was the case also for other diseases. Well, that, that was interesting because we know from other data that people move from this high risk area to a low risk area, vice versa. They get the disease of the country to which they move without changing their genetic background. Very interesting idea. Okay, we did make a, a big study. We got lots of findings, and I think you're looking for me to slow down, quit, whatever. Here's a practical advice: whole food plant based diet. What the China did looks comes in either way. Real secret here. What the China study did was standing alone. It did not give the conclusion that I now hold. It was only just an addition to complement the studies we've done a lot of I'll throw that in. There's a book coming out very soon. It has to do with all the claims about the Atlas diet, the uh, South Beach diet, the protein power diet, the paleo diet, all those diets coming by very sincere names on a regular basis or all one and same. They're low carb diets, as you may know. Low carb diet means that they're high protein, high fat diet. They don't tell you that. But all those diets are advocating very high protein, high fat consumption. And I have to tell you, that is, in my view, a fraud. Because it's a misrepresentation of what really can work, you know, in larger things. So let me stop there. Thank you very much. I think you're going to start the year.
Dr. Esselstyn was even more surprised by the numbers he discovered for some other types of cancer. In the entire nation of Japan in 1958, how many autopsy proven deaths were there from cancer of the prostate? 18. 18 in the entire nation. That, to me, was about the most money. Plan. We're always trained. Never had heart disease, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis. Never overweight. They were in their 80s and 90s and fully functional. Their kids got a little fatter, a little sicker. Their grandkids and the next generation were just as fat and sick as anybody. I had unpleasant hunger feelings, groggy after meals, strong food cravings, and anxiety about food in general. All of that stuff. Sounds like I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't need to, you know. By 1975, Dr. Campbell was at Cornell University investigating what he discovered in the Philippines. Our work from the beginning was designed, in a sense, to do two main things. One, I wanted to replicate, if possible, the Indian work because it was so provocative. Secondly, if this is really true, I wanted to study how does it work. Just like the Indian researchers, Campbell fed half the rats in his study a diet of 20% casein the main protein and dairy products. The other half was fed only 5% casein. Over the 12 weeks of the study, the rats eating the higher protein diet had a greatly enhanced level of early liver cancer tumor growth. On the other hand, all of the rats eating only 5% protein had no evidence of cancer whatsoever. But Dr. Campbell decided to... In 1973, the U.S. Congress passed a new farm subsidy bill. Among other things, it included incentives that encouraged a massive increase in corn production. One of the major byproducts of this enormous corn surplus was a low-cost sweetener called high-fructose corn syrup. Companies could add this sweetener to anything from soda pop to hot dogs, and then make these products widely available at low prices. Processed sugars and other refined on similar but separate paths finally met face to face. On the one hand, I'm coming from the scientific room, getting some ideas. He's coming from the clinical room and doing some dramatic research. Here's the science, here's the clinical evidence. Put the dirt together, it's amazing. When he learned of Campbell's research, Esselstyn removed dairy products from his patient's diet. The results of his ongoing study continue to be impressive. And in 1995, he published a paper detailing them in a noted scientific journal. Yet one of Esselstyn's most remarkable success stories involved a colleague of his at the Cleveland Clinic, Dr. Joseph Crow. Actually, I was um, active, healthy, very busy, uh, mid-40s. He said, these are the studies that show what I'm trying to prove is that diet can reverse breast cancer and she read it, and she comes out and says, okay, I've changed my diet. She changed her diet. So he showed me how to eat, no added oils, um, lots of fruits and vegetables, whole grains. Ruth then started training for the Ironman Triathlon. Which is linked to the genes? Is it only food that should be maybe cooked in a different way or something? How can you explain this, the people who look in perfect health, do fall sick at the end. Thank you. That's really, that's really a good question. Uh, yes, a lot of people who presume they're quite healthy uh, suddenly, you know, experience a disease in one sort or another. So a lot of disease that I think tends to occur, especially with heart disease and cancer, is kind of uh, you know, subliminal, or we, don't, we don't see it until it arises, but the risk factors that cause those diseases? Peter, and then I'll take the answers. Yes, um, thanks, Dr. Campbell. It's nice to know about you and meet you in the flesh. Uh, I think what is really, uh, so I'm wondering, I think a lot of us are completely in agreement with what you're, you've been preaching for, and thank you for going on doing it. But I think the issue is, how do we move forwards? Because we have, uh, in a house like ours, uh, when the first studies were 
what is it the world needs to produce in 2050, they base their projection on the fact that the Indians and the Chinese would eat the same thing that the Europeans and the US people. I say, well, wait a minute, we're fighting to try and get that to some common sense. Now, stop using that. And they say, yes, but that's what people want to eat. It's like, well, what people want to eat is what they're told they should eat. And I think maybe we should stop changing. So the issue is, we can't count on ministers of agriculture to do that, because in Central America, they are all cattle grazers and big families. So they're not going to start saying these kind of things or wanting these kind of things to happen. So this meeting was, the invitation was conveyed by the partnership and advocacy people. How can we start having an alliance of people that carry no weight so that the people that are actually leading the world cannot go on pretending they don't know about it and follow a food chain approach that is, we all know, is driving the planet to its end and ourselves at the same time. Thank you. Well, I just have to say, thank you so much for having me here at FAO to start with. I know about Dr. Boyd Orr's uh, views and, and the views of others who have been involved in the agency and the USDA and then my community too, I must admit, you know, the NIH sort of community. Uh, you know, we, we have, unfortunately, been living in a fog. You know, when you're with you, in that fog, we don't seem to question, we keep proceeding ahead. And so, uh, and one of the uh, observations that I think is really telling is the fact that medical schools are training doctors who are primary caretakers in most societies. In medical schools, there's not one school in the United States that even teaches the general subject of nutrition, let alone this kind of nutrition. In my sort of biomedical research community, and I've been involved in policy and all, all sort of all levels, um, we have, for example, in NIH, 28 institutes, Heart Institute, Cancer Institute, this and that. We don't have one called the Institute of Nutrition. The subject of nutrition in most academic institutions, as many of you may know, tends to suffer and compared to its reputation compared to other areas of even pharmacology or cardiology or diabetesology and so forth and so on. I mean, nutrition is not a respected discipline. So we've got to train the professionals first. And I think for you folks here too, you're obviously involved in administering very important programs around the, around the world. And I, I really do believe that somehow We've got to start ourselves, you know, as, as the professionals, uh, talking about this and debating this, and then coming to some kind of, you know, sen sensible agreement, and then go out and tell the rest of the society. Otherwise, I think the, the real movement is going to come from the ground moves up. I know we see this in the United States. We do these little studies. People do it. They tell their folks, and on and on and on. It's going to come from the bottom up, and you know, even faster than the bottom, than the top down. But it doesn't hurt also to work at the top. Okay, Peter, and then Warren, and then I see Warren in the back. Peter? Yes, thanks a lot, Dr. Campbell. Of course, the film was very interesting, and I would like to thank you for this. Uh, I would like to make a few remarks regarding this confusion. Obviously, that there is science which tells us medical science, the nutrition science, which tells us about the importance of protein, and here you go, you find the complete opposite effect, actually. The confusion is actually not a confusion. As soon as we start looking behind who drives the science, who drives the communication about science, scientific information, that is the key to the, to the uh, solution of this, of this strange uh, uh, mystical uh, situation that we have science which tells us a certain message about the importance of protein and if we think about of the 1960s, 1970s, protein requirements scientifically established were much higher than later on and all of a sudden the problem disappeared to, just by sheer numbers. But the point is not only to look at the scientific uh, uh, debate, at the scientific uh, uh, findings, the point is also to look into the question who is behind the financing of the science, who is behind the, the dissemination of the scientific findings. And I had myself 20 years ago when I joined FAO the experience that it wasn't the right place to talk about the, the facts in nutrition science which are known. 
So, in other words, there was tendency to spread uh, biased information, and, and that's the key to these kinds of questions. Not so much about uh, uh, debating whether this piece of scientific research is true or the other one, but it's much more important to look behind who is driving, who are the, the, the actors behind the scene. These are the key to the problem. So true, so true. And then, incidentally, I've asked myself that question in a book I just published called Whole, rather than use the word. Uh, I always ask myself, rather than you know, getting uh, bothered by individuals within our communities or even the institutions or the industry, I was curious to know if there's something about the way we think about things, especially the way we think about scientific matters and how we do research and so on. I wrote that book and was kind of excited and surprised that uh, sort of uh, become aware of something that was known a long time ago. And that is everything sort of working together. What we've done is science, we have focused on one nutrient at a time. You know, in the laboratory, we study things, or if we're doing epidemiological studies, you know, we tend to adjust for confounding, and people, I think you will know what I'm talking about there. We, try, we tend to be driven by trying to find that magic chemical that either causes harm or possibly, you know, can offer a solution. And so we, we're living in this reductionist community of science. That, get, that has a close link to the way we actually run the marketplace. That's what we have to understand. Yeah. Uh, Warren has the next uh, question. Thank you, Dr. Ken. I have been aware of your work since the early stage of my career. I even got your book of the 65 countries in China study, you know, I recommended my department of health in Hong Kong to keep a copy for the library. And uh, I'd, um, I've been reading you know, your uh, scientific work you know, in China in relation to your 65 countries study. There has been some criticism you know, on your work. They said that well, what this uh, study design was you know, called um, you know, association studies, correlation study, and you know, there was no you know, the cause, effect, cause and uh, effect you know, the trial, like, uh, clinical trial, etc. And only like that you know, your study is based on ecological study design and in your publication is that it's, it's one of the best in your design in which you look at the association between you know, disease and, uh, and, uh, and, and diet. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the strength of your findings from, you know, from, from this you know, big cohort study in China of which you base you know, to uh, recommend your uh, plant design? Well, thank you for that question. I know it's been asked before, but I, I think as a first approximation to try to understand that, I would suggest that anyone who is aware of those concerns, look at the people who are making the concerns. No. Too often there are some people who are totally untrained in the field, have not been in science, and seem to have another agenda for starters. But I don't want to whitewash that and just sort of ignore the question, because I think the question you're asking really is, for example, in our, in our study designs that we use, you know, to ascertain what might be true and what might not be true, we sell them in science, almost never in science can we do a single experiment and get the whole answer. You know, we just don't do it that way. Uh, so in the China study, in my experience, working in the laboratory, being involved in policy, doing human studies, getting involved in this big population-based study, it was actually drawing from each of those the weight of the evidence, not absolute proof, the weight of the evidence, and then sort of aggregating it, spreading it out, and looking at it. That's where I sort of draw my, my conclusions. On the question, and, and just to give an example, on the population-based studies, I think you're aware that some are concerned about the fact that I'm using correlations to you know, infer causality. For any of you in the epidemiology would understand that. I didn't do that. They say I did that, but they get the book and they say I did. You go back and look, and these are people who are not trained in the field. Now, there may be some trained epidemiologists who are concerned about you know, my, my supposedly doing that. The China study itself did not, in fact, lead me to my conclusion. It was a totality of this. The China study was really an opportunity. This is a big population-based study with lots of correlations. I, what, the way I assembled the data, was to actually sort of look at the data in the aggregate and build models, like uh, what's the 
cause of breast cancer, for example, or what's the cause of colon cancer, and then look at all the different factors we tend to know about, some maybe we didn't know about, then it will go back and determine biological plausibility. I wanted to ask the question concerning biological plausibility, consistency of evidence, you know, whether the time trend changes are consistent with what we saw in, in you know, in the short time. So, and then looking at the laboratory, where we get biological plausibility kind of arguments, and just looking at it in its totality. And the final analysis, what we said in the book, even with my attempt to try to do this in a reasonably sophisticated way, I said to the reader, you don't need to believe me, just try it. And that's what people have done. And I'm overwhelmed, in fact, with what I've seen when people try it. It's just very simple, straightforward. And I see the hands of the people who need to ask questions. Okay, uh, could we go over beside Peter? I don't know your name. And, and then we'll go back to this side of the room. Hello, just, uh, just quickly, uh, that is fish actually part of the... Can you hear? Yeah, is, fish you know, in, is fish included in the in this animal protein? Exactly the same as animal, you know, uh, protein coming from uh, cows, uh, pigs, etc. Is fish part of it? Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. We, we work with casing, and so I tend to make some generalizations about animal protein in general, not just from that, but from the work of others, of course. And uh, actually, protein to all the proteins, when compared, divide themselves into two aggregate groups, the animal-based proteins and the plant-based proteins. We see that published many years ago in terms of their effect on blood cholesterol levels, or the de development of atherogenesis, or the creation of metabolic acidosis, and so forth and so on. And so animal proteins as a group have about the same biological value, we call it. You may be familiar with that they tend to have the same biological value, which means efficiency of utilization. Compared to the plants, we can see some differences between plants, of course, but they tend to, in the aggregate, there's no overlap. You got biological value for plants here, <coughs> and biological for animals here. There's sort of like two different groups like that. And so too, when you look at that in reference to their ability to encourage body weight gain, which is great for farm production, you want to do that, or the laying of eggs or whatever. You see the same aggregation of animal-based foods as a group of cause and effect response. It's, it's just across the board. So I, I feel comfortable generalizing. Okay, uh, sorry, back to this side, Ellen and then William. And, uh, and then we'll move to the back of the room. Very, very interesting indeed. Um, uh, I think there is, of course, plenty of evidence to suggest that, that sorry, that uh, the diets that are largely plant-based, um, where there are small amounts of meat or small amounts of fish, very little processed uh, meat, uh, are, are much healthier. Uh, and um, I think the International Cancer Research Fund has also clearly shown that. Uh, um, and, and, and recommends very low meat-based diets. Um, uh, so I think there is there is plenty of evidence to to support um, what you're saying. Um, now, FEO uh, works, of course, in, in many developing countries where we are facing problems of, of undernutrition. Not, uh, however, there is also a rising incidence of, of overweight and obesity. Uh, and increased incidence of chronic diseases, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, etc., is on, on the rise in, in many, many countries. Now, when it comes to addressing and preventing issues of undernutrition, especially as far as uh, small children are concerned, there is a very strong uh, recommendation from the scientific nutrition community uh, to say that children need. Um, uh, animal foods. They cannot grow and develop properly on plant-based diets only. And plant-based diets only are not recommended for children, primarily because they're lacking 
iron, sufficient amounts of iron and zinc. I would be very interested to see what, what are your views on this. Yeah, I, I, I know that kind of thing has been said often, but some of those criticism too, I would suggest are very reductionist, like for example the iron question just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the China study we did, we measured iron layers in six different ways. In intake as well as serum iron, serum uh, ferritin, uh, hemoglobin, uh, what else did we do? Uh, total iron body capacity and so forth. They all did not, they, they showed that the closer that people got to, let's say, a plant based diet, the healthier they were. We know, and I'm sure you probably will agree, that most iron deficiency or let's say anemic conditions that exist in the third world in particular, a lot of that is due to parasitic infestation. Uh, and it's, you know, and so we, under those circumstances, yes, we can give iron supplementation. I know some of the data that some, some earlier just haven't seen it recently, but iron supplementation at times can be shown to have some beneficial effect under those circumstances. But keep in mind, those populations being administered supplementation are often the ones who as I say, they also suffer from a burden of, of a parasitic infestation. So it's not surprising we can come along with like it's a remedial kind of approach to a problem that already exists. When in fact, if we, if, if we could take care of the public health issues, reduce the parasitic infestation, offer them a full, uh, you know, full, full, full foods, all plant based, we don't see anemia. It just simply goes away. We don't see that in the West when we don't have parasitic infestation. But there's other things. I know, I know there's criticism from time to time that people who are, let's say, in the third world countries these days, and I don't think that's sort of the correct word to use these days, but in many days, we've got, and it's more than in the least developed country, we've got a two headed monster now. We've got the deficiency, we all know about that. It still exists amongst the poor. And then we have this. Um, ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっ
so they could produce what we really produce food. And because so many people, especially in the poor areas of the world, uh, I've been told this by my Chinese colleagues for a long time, look, you guys, you, you became, and they actually said this, and not quite politically correct, but you guys became civilized because you were eating, you know, all that animal-based food, now it's our turn. You know, it's, 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 it's in sort of inherent belief that, you know, civilization comes along with eating animal protein-based foods is still with us. Still with us, and we've got to somehow correct and amend that kind of thinking. Okay, so back there we talk back. Thank you very much for a very interesting uh, film and uh, presentation. I would like to follow up on the comments and questions on fish, of course. On which? On fish. On fish. On fish. On fish. On fish. Uh, in my view, I think fish, of course, is a source of protein, but maybe more important as a source of uh, essential fatty acids and micronutrients. Mm -hmm. And one observation was the countries in Asia that was used as an example are also high fish uh, consumers. That's just a comment. And then there was an example from uh, Norway how the, the coronary heart diseases dropped during the Second World War. And just a comment there also, since I'm, I'm from Norway, and my knowledge about what happened then was, as presented in the film, that consumption of meat went down, and what happened was that also consumption of fish went up, because it was a cheap source of protein, or of food, herring and mackerel. But the consumption of, uh, of let's say, vegetables was I think more stable because we have three months where you can produce potatoes, wheat, and uh, all fruit, fruits that can be stored for winter. So what happened, I think in practice was, in, case, in, the, in the meat products like pork and, and, and beef and dairy products went down, but at the same time, consumption of herring went significantly up because of low cost and Easily accessible for all everybody else. Yeah, I, let, let me go back to the film. It's a, it's a place in the film that I think is not entirely a clear representation. It shows how my friend Dr. Essethan talks about the gradual increase you know, in, in heart disease and wild plummet. Look into that chart a more carefully and you may have seen it. It goes from 30, not down to zero, but from 30 down to about 24. That's only a 20% drop. That's a significant, we, we can agree with that. That's a significant drop. But it's not quite as dramatic as what otherwise people might otherwise believe. So the changes, as I understand it, we're going to data from the uh, World War II experience, is that the changes in health that did occur are really uh, interesting, significant, yes, but not as, as dramatic as we might as otherwise have, have thought. And so when I see about a 10 or 20 percent change, uh, we got to be a little careful about making precise statements about individual foods under those circumstances because in a wartime situation, as I'm sure you appreciate, um, there's many things changing at the same time. It's really hard experimentally, I think, especially in uh, observational studies like that, to reach in and pull out the individual components that may or may not have been responsible for the changes, especially when the changes aren't as great as what we sometimes pretend they are. Okay, uh, two more questions here. One, two, three questions. One, two, three, and then we have to close. Good evening, Doctor. Um, I was uh, very curious about uh, the fact that the EMA evaluation is turned off. Put it closer to your mouth. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, I was um, curious if you ever reevaluated your amazing study under a different point of view, like perhaps if uh, towards cancer, perhaps evaluation, if the food that was uh, given to this, um, the, the patients was compatible or the uh, genoma of the patient or not, and in this point of view, whether foods compatible, even though like uh, proteins were more uh, causing damage 
over genitalium or stomach to coordinate immunitary dysfunction for the cancer spread. Then food that uh, was or vegetables, let's say. I, I, th I think the question you're asking, if I could maybe rephrase it, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you know, uh, disease occurs, illness occurs for a variety of different reasons. This is something we can all agree to. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can discover a lot of chemicals that we may get exposed to and other things that we know if we look at them independently, you know, they may be somewhat questionable. Obviously, addictive drugs or, you know, chemicals that can cause cancer and so forth. Um, this is, this is our lifestyle. In some unfortunate cases, uh, people get exposed to a lot of bad things, if you will. Be they chemicals, or maybe they have some genetic susceptibilities, for example. Uh, what I find interesting about this, although we have, may all have different starting points for the creation of illness, in other words, different genetic susceptibilities, or perhaps different exposures to toxic chemicals, that, although we may have different baselines, let me say it that way, if you superimpose across all of that a, a, a diet that is uh, made up of foods having a nutrient composition of whole plant-based foods, everybody, it reaches the boat for everybody. And, and so some people will see big changes, other people will see small changes because they, you know, if, if you will, but you know, it seems like everybody sort of responds in the same direction, maybe not necessarily the same degree, but the same direction. That's an important point to consider. So, uh, just the rat studies that we did, those animals were exposed to a, the most potent chemical carcinogen ever dis discovered, at least for rats. Yet, yeah, I mean, even though the circumstances, given those animals exposed to enough lethal dose even, you know, you, you can get protein and, you, and, and basically you can block it just with modest changes in protein intake. And so too is also true for other chemical carcinogens as well. So I, I kind of sort out this complexity to which I think you're referring. Uh, no, I am I missing the point? No, I just, no, maybe I can't express myself so well because I'm not, it's not my first language anyway. But the thing is that uh, we do belong yeah, to the interpreter needs you to speak in the microphone. Uh, in a monological, um, uh, but, but I think this, uh, this seminar is is a little bit uh, not on the area of uh, genetic differences or, or the nutrigenomic area. No, no, which is I was what I think talking about that if perhaps I'm allergic to potatoes or she's allergic to rice. Okay. If this was more cancerogenic, then uh, a piece of meat. I mean, so in the same kind of study. So eating something which is not protein, but vegetable or fruit, but it's against uh, uh, perhaps with... Sorry, we have to wrap this up there. They need to close the room. So maybe uh, maybe that can be addressed later. And we've got two quick ones here, and, uh, and then we have to go. Make it quick, please. Thank you. My, my question is, uh, I'm assuming it's difficult to get funding to do research on fruits and vegetables and grains because it's of no interest to... Uh, uh, the medical industry. Um, uh, to what extent have you articulated further what are the different impacts of different fruits and vegetables and their combinations since they're such a powerful uh, chemical and uh, micronutrient effect on different types of illnesses? No, 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 Oh, there is there interpretation? Yeah, no, 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 no,
minor differences we tend to see between different kinds of leaves, spinach, collard greens, and so forth. The minor differences we might see are really still very minor. You know, and it, because the big effect that we're interested in is just simply eating them to begin with. So. Okay, and the last question for your patients. Um, I am curious, now that so many people are aware of the dangers of dairy and they're converting to soy milk, are you at all concerned about the reports that soy products increase risk of cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer? Did you see any evidence of that in your research? Um, yeah, I, I've been aware of the soy versus dairy debates as I was developing because at that time, in fact, it was an interest to, for the Filipino farmers to take on soy production as a means of having an export commodity. And when soon as that arose, the dairy industry in the West, you know, got upset about it, you know, why do this? And I saw that first hand. Then later, uh, when the soy was being used in the 80s, or being proposed for school lunch programs as soy burgers instead of hamburgers, for example, or instead of milk, the, the howl arose again. The dairy industry would just hammer away. But then the soy industry got pretty thrifty itself and pretty strong. So then in the more recent years, like the last 20, 30 years, I find that the soy industry is quite capable of defending itself, and even more so, it hammers away and argues the other way around. So I just want to say that, that the conflict between the two industries has been intense, not altogether accurate. Now I come back and sort of, if I may, answer your question. So keep that in mind, because a lot of the debate goes on. Soy has estrogenic material in it, yes. But interestingly, the level of estrogenic material in soy products is really quite low when you eat the whole soy bean. And in fact, those, that estrogen level actually acts as an anti-estrogen when consumed. And so therefore, the estrogen levels that may be present in soybeans, if anything, is a benefit, not a detriment. I think the question, though, may become significant, though, if we're consuming really high amounts of soy, particularly extracts of soy, let's say it's tofu, or, you know, we're really gorging ourselves in very high levels of that, in which case then there is some evidence that that estrogenic activity may have some consequences. So it sort of comes back for me to argue that legumes are good. You know, there's soy, they create an industry. But what about peas and beans and so forth and so on? They have these kind of properties too. So I think I, I'm not concerned about the soy argument, not, not in reference to the whole food. I think we could go on for hours, uh, and I'm really uh, appreciative of the uh, Civil Society Dialogue for inviting uh, Professor Campbell to speak to us. It was an excellent choice. We in the Nutrition Division uh, are very appreciative. Uh, in fact, I don't think we would have been able to pull this off uh, so easily as uh, the Civil Society Dialogue has. Uh, so please, uh, unfortunately we have to end, so please join with me and thank uh, Professor Campbell for this very